We are beginning our panel discussion, which is titled Regional Economic Communities Integration to Compete and Pathway to Inclusive Globalization. The, actual, the title of this panel uh, contains two key points and uh, uh, globalization and regionalization. And it's not accidental. It's not accidental precisely because these two processes, regionalization and globalization, in recent decades have determined the image of the constantly changing world. Uh, these processes used to run parallel without touching upon each other. They used to uh, be in confrontation, in rigid confrontation, but one way or the other, they have shaped the world uh, in 2008 that approached, entered the financial crisis and which was a, a radical catalyst for integration and globalization processes all over the world. And in this sense, uh, what we are witnessing today within the framework of all uh, venues, world venues, the turbulent development of all uh, processes, no, migration processes, well, of course, they are a component of regional and national protectionism, is an attempt to respond to the challenges that took shape within the framework of globalization processes. In my view, uh, when we talk right now about the second wave of financial crisis, it would be correct to talk about the globalization crisis, which means to a certain extent that the object and the processes that once uh, that were once launched uh, have now changed, and the key players have also changed today on these global venues. And the system of management remain, or systems remain the same, and they are incapable of ensuring a sustainable growth. In this sense, in my view, the future of the world will be determined by the dialogue between integration structures and will largely depend on the efficiency of integration structures and the efficiency of the dialogue uh, between them. So in this configuration, the national governments and integration structures and the dialogue between them, and that's where the uh, image of the future world will take shape uh, within the next 50 or 70 years. I think that's the initial point that I wanted to uh, uh, drive home here. Now let me go over to our uh, panelists, to our, uh, so first of all, I would like uh, uh, to give the floor to Jose Angel Guria Trevelia, the General Secretary of o, um, OECD, uh, which was created as a regional organization and became a global institution after some time uniting develop, uh, de uh, developed nations, in fact, the countries that took responsibility for globalization processes, the countries that actually uh, uh, declared their mission uh, towards uh, more transparency, openness in the world, and on this basis, uh, reducing uh, <clears throat> uh, bridging the gap between the wealthiest and the poorest nations, ensuring sustainable development. So let me ask uh, Mr. Guria whether this mission uh, today has been uh, fulfilled and uh, what uh, does OECD think how to get out of the current crisis, the, any ways out of the current crisis, what are the deadlines, the time schedule for that, and what exactly we can do to move ahead, to move forward towards sustainable uh, development. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, let me just say uh, today uh, we have a very mediocre and a very, uh, uh, a mosaic really of um, uh, economic uh, situations around the world, we clearly have uh, a better performing region, and that is uh, uh, the United States, uh, which notwithstanding the fact of these automatic cuts, 
uh, in their budgets because of uh, legal reasons, because they couldn't have a political agreement. Um, it's still, it's going uh, very, very uh, robustly, and I would say they leave one to one and a half percent growth on the table, and still they're growing, which means really there is something underlying there that is that is moving along. It's improving also in terms of about 38 months of continuously creating new jobs, although sometimes they don't create them at the speed we'd like, but uh, they've recovered about three million of the jobs lost before. Uh, Japan is doing better because they are applying a, a not only monetary stimulus, uh, but also uh, fiscal stimulus, which is a very unique combination. Uh, before, uh, you had a very typical formula, loose monetary policy and tight fiscal policy. Japan is practicing a loose monetary policy and a loose uh, fiscal policy, at least in the short term, and now they're applying structural measures, the third arrow in the Abenomics uh, that type of package. So that, again, looks good. Uh, uh, not so good in Europe, uh, practically flat and negative in many cases, uh, and not looking good for the rest of 2013, maybe picking up uh, towards the end of this year uh, into 2014. And then, of course, uh, uh, in the case of the uh, large emerging economies, uh, China moving a little south of 8%, maybe moving north of 8% by next year, having a problem with the credit crunch uh, as we speak. And in the case of India, uh, a, a slowdown in their, uh, uh, their growth. Uh, so uh, many speeds, huh? many speeds, and, and not a, a single uh, common uh, focus in terms of how to get there. Uh, but it brings us to uh, our, our panel of today, uh, regional uh, economic communities, regional integration. Can that help? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, there are a lot of things going on in this sphere. Uh, and I have to say, it's, it's great because trade has always been a great driver. And, uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, because uh, Doha did not get very far. Uh, Hello. Um, uh, because we are not, uh, uh, because we didn't uh, close at Doha, because we're going into trade facilitation negotiations at the end of the, of the year. Uh, basically, uh, they, we, we tend to overlook that there's a lot of activity. I was in Loch Ern two days ago with the G8, and the leaders there announced, of course, uh, uh, the launch of negotiations of the EU and uh, uh, the United States. I think this is a very exciting, great potential. It can be an injection both of growth and jobs and trust, because trust is something we are also missing. Uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a very exciting and very interesting uh, possibility also. And it can get the other part of the world uh, uh, involved. Um, and, uh, of course, the Eurasian Economic Community. Which okay, I thought it was definitely cut off. Um, uh, again, a very exciting possibility and uh, something which can... Uh, obviously help again. They provide what we're missing. We're short of growth. We are short of jobs. Uh, jobs are, uh, you know, unemployment in the euro area is 12 percent. Uh, 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 youth unemployment is 26 percent. In some cases it's as high as 50 percent. Uh, and trust in, in the institutions that we've created over the last hundred years. Uh, trust in governments, trust in ministers, prime ministers, presidents, uh, in, in, in the banking system, and trust in the political party. Okay. Now, now there's a lot of cynicism and people uh, are, are already doubting uh, whether they should uh, continue to trust these institutions because they're not delivering. So what we're having, uh, what is happening now in terms of regional economic communities is very exciting and I should say provides a very interesting alternative to our traditional view of how we were looking at, uh, at uh, the economic recovery and the economic growth. This can really be a big catapult, a big starter, a big lever uh, these regional uh, economic communities. Now, there's also uh, um, 
something that is uh, uh, extremely uh, important. Uh, uh, they, they cover very large swaths of ground. Uh, just the transatlantic is 50% of the world's GDP, 30% of the world's trade, 20% of the world's investment. You rarely, you know, every time you get a bilateral agreement, you get 0 0.5 or 0 0.05 or whatever. This is huge. This is enormous, you know, and this there, therefore can have a very, very uh, important uh, uh, impact. Uh, now, the benefits, well, we've calculated that there's about 250 billion of benefits to be spread mostly, you know, uh, the U.S. on one side, the, the Europeans on the other, but also the rest of the world because of the global value chains and the way uh, imports and exports uh, uh, work today. But uh, there'd be a very, very uh, large impact in terms of uh, overall uh, boost to GDP. The Eurasian Customs Union, it's called ECU. It's a little strange because one says the ECU is like the former currency of Europe. Uh, but that means probably it's integrating in that direction, which is good. Um, uh, but uh, the, the European, uh, the Eurasian Customs Union, again, uh, something very important, representing a striking departure from what we've seen in the last 20 years. Uh, this is a Russian-led initiative in the region. It's ambitious. Uh, it's more ambitious, certainly, that, uh, than previous initiatives. Turned out to be, uh, you know, in the past, did not go uh, very far. Um, uh, clearly, uh, here we're talking about uh, 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 a truly vivid global multilateral system, and uh, this proliferation of regional agreements uh, typically says they they risk the question or the whole thing. If you have more bilateral agreements or regional agreements, they will make it even more difficult to have a multilateral agreement. I would say I I I, I agree with the fact that ideally we should go for a multilateral agreement, but it has eluded us. And the question is, do we shrug and uh, drop our arms and say, okay, so be it, we do nothing? No. The answer is we go for what is possible. But as we were discussing a moment ago in another panel, make sure that the architecture of these regional economic communities, these regional economic integrations are consistent and that they could eventually add to uh, a type of multilateral uh, organization. Uh, and that, that can really, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the non-discriminatory nature, they can, they, can be addition, they can provide additionality and that uh, from the regulatory point of view, they're not uh, exclusions. Uh, uh, let me uh, uh, finally uh, say that um, uh, these agreements would tend to have some degree of overlap. Yes. Do we have a choice? I don't think so. I think we should go for it. Uh, does the degree of overlap provide uh, unbearable or uh, on, you know, obstacles we cannot overcome? The answer is no. Regional economic communities come natural. They happen because they were probably meant to happen and because they're easier to put together and because there are many more things in common than if you try to have you know, a, a worldwide uh, uh, discussion. However, let me just uh, end on a more multilateral note. We are going to have worldwide discussions about one particular subject at the end of the year, which is trade facilitation. And I can say, you know, every 1% that we reduce the costs of global trade will accrue 40 billion of benefits. Mostly, about two-thirds will go to the developing countries. And the potential that we have of reducing costs throughout the world goes anywhere from 10 to 14%, 16%, depending on the country. So you can multiply that by the benefits. So just even if you're very modest and you're ambitious, you can see the enormous spillover that this can have. So let's go for the regional economic communities. Absolutely, yes. But let's not uh, you know, lose sight of the bigger target, which is a more multilateral trading system. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gurian. Uh, what I understand, there is one technical 
difficulty. Mr. Guria was talking about different models, uh, different formats that uh, are taking shape today. Transatlantica, 50% of the world GDP, uh, and crossing Pacific and so on and so forth, so which uh, emphasizes the search for the right solutions. And it's not easy to combine everything, to integrate everything. Even the electromagnetic compatibility as microphones fail and do not help us to work today. So it's not easy. Let me uh, give the floor to Tatiana Valovaya. Uh, a person who is well known in integration processes in different areas of this work so we could try to uh, shed light uh, on uh, the key points on the uh, key activities within the Eurasian uh, project today from the viewpoint of the situation uh, current situation and also in connection with the opinion of Mr. Guria. Thank you. Uh, let me follow up on uh, the subject uh, started by Mr. Guria, whether the regional projects are compatible with multilateral global projects. And at this point, I would like what I would like to say that in my view, uh, while talking about the first global crisis that uh, we've uh, lived through in the first half of the 21st century and the crisis of globalization, I think it would be more apt to say about the crisis of the global economy in the absence of uh, the real global management. So what we are uh, facing now, we have global economy on micro level, the companies and banks, the financial system are truly global. And what happens right now in Tokyo has an impact on what's uh, going on in London uh, within one minute. Unfortunately, we do not have the global management processes. In other words, uh, what we witnessed in the second half of the uh, 20th century, so there were two processes running parallel, first and full globalization of economic processes. And on institutional level, we witnessed a fragmentation of the well, geographic map. So if you look at this map today, we see that the League of Nations included about 60 nations, and the United Nations, which was set up by 50 nations, now comprises about 200 nations. And it, uh, indeed, in the second half of the 20th century, the number of sovereign players on the world economic uh, venue has increased. Well, of course, it is no longer possible to build relations within the framework of the obsolete structures, and the world has become even more fragmented. So integration, in my opinion, is not fragmentation of the world space, but rather a pathway towards uh, unification, creating major big players that will allow us to overcome the fragmented map of the world due to major economic uh, as, uh, um, associations um, that are building a new, uh, new type of economic relations. And in this sense, Mr. Guria was quite right as he said that it uh, will be possible in case the economic uh, associations and organizations will uh, continue to live under uh, uh, common <coughs> properties. And it is not accidental that as we started this work on setting up the Eurasian Economic Union and creating the uniform uh, economic space, we uh, paid very close attention to the exper experience of the European Union and the story uh, that uh, witnessed uh, the uh, creation of the first supranational economic amalgamation. So, so this is a first kind of such uh, integration, uh, integrated organization, our economic uh, customs union. So that's why, as we talk right now about the development of integration within the framework of the uh, uh, Eurasian Union, so we look at it on uh, the one hand from the global context, on the, on the other hand, we need to think how we should develop further. There is always a dilemma. So we can either develop intensively deepening integration or extensively as expanding our geographical uh, uh, coverage. And at a certain stage, it becomes clear that, in fact, the way of intensive development is, uh, to a certain degree, much more efficient as compared to extensive development. Or of course, any in integrated uh, community, um, if it is successful, becomes, uh, it looks like uh, a vacuum cleaner, because as it actively develops, it becomes, uh, it's uh, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, in, uh, sucking in its partners into its orbit. But nevertheless, the our integration process continue to deepen. That's why we are facing the task of developing integration right now. Towards 2015, we already have a, a clear-cut agenda. So first and foremost, we are supposed to set up a Eurasian Economic Union, and within the frame of this union, the uh, uniform economic space is going to be set up with four degrees of freedom. And as the last summit in Astana decided, by 2015, the uniform economic space should uh, function without any limitations. So it's going to be quite a complicated task. So it will be sufficient to say that this task uh, <clears throat> was uh, resolved by the European U Union uh, within uh, 18 years. The customs union uh, uh, was set up uh, uh, in the 70s, and the uh, uniform uh, economic space was created in the mid-80s. So, But we will be able to speed up this process as we can uh, remove these barriers right now. And the statistics confirm this process. So if we take data, uh, if we proceed from the data, uh, from uh, 2012, we can say quite clearly that we can witness an integration effect. During the previous two years, the rates of uh, the trade growth rates uh, were quite sufficient, but they uh, uh, were lagging behind our uh, <coughs> foreign trade growth. Uh, in 2012, our foreign trade growth was only 3 percent, but our mutual trade within this space uh, increased by 4%. So in the meantime, we witness uh, a significant growth in the share of uh, the manufacturing industries in the trade. So if uh, trade um, accounts for only 10% of the overall trade volume in terms of uh, trade in uh, machines and equipment and manufacturing industry uh, over the um, existence of the economic union has increased up to 18 or 23 percent, which is a significant growth over the last three years, uh, which uh, testifies to the fact that the integration is moving in the right direction. So right now we are facing the task of preparing a white book and to understand uh, uh, what we, we have, uh, what exemptions we have from the uniform economic space uh, so we could uh, uh, draw up a road map and it will try to uh, describe these exemptions so that by 2015, by January 2015, uh, this uniform economic space will be fully functional. Uh, this is where we position this uh, uh, union globally. In our view, this is the most natural partner for the European Union and uh, trans-ocean uh, and transatlantic partnership. This is the area of overlapping uh, regional unions that will enable us to uh, develop a global management system because if all these organizations are based on clear common principles then agreeing uh, between uh, a few major players will be much easier than between a hundred countries with different uh, national agendas so in my view the development of uh, national integ uh, Eurasian integration is not a fragmented process this should be a successful project to build Eurasian space in the new uh, developing global economy. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. I would uh, recall that some time ago the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development published an re analytical report about uh, the integration processes in the post-Soviet space, uh, which is what uh, Mrs. Volovaya talked about, and that was the most successful integration project in the post-Soviet space. And uh, therefore, I'd like to address Frederick Berdloff, uh, Eric Berdloff, as an expert who knows a lot about these issues and follow them closely. What are the most important risks on the one hand and what opportunities on the other of uh, this uh, Eurasian project? What, what risks and opportunities does it have? Okay. 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 Uh, good morning. 
I agree very much with what uh, Andrea Gria said, and I think it was also uh, implicit and, and, and sometimes explicit in, in, in what uh, Mrs. Uh, Bolobaya said. The um, regionalism is here globally to stay. Uh, uh, regionalism will be something that we will have to learn to live with. Of course, the way we should do it is try to view this as a stepping stone to something uh, more, more ambitious at the international level. I think it's this very much the same thinking about uh, the Eurasian economic space and the integration process in this part of the world. Uh, early on we were dismissing this as something that was more a, a, a subject for promoting the uh, negotiations over WTO from, from the Russian side, I think that's, that's a big mistake. There are very real uh, economic and political consequences. There are very important resources being devoted to, to this uh, initiative, both in terms of uh, work to improve institutions, work uh, uh, devoting uh, very qualified uh, human capital uh, uh, to this uh, project and we should take it seriously. We tried to do so as uh, Mr. Kristenka said. We, uh, we have looked at, at this. It's very early days still to, to assess this but I think it is important to look at what, what the consequences are because it, it, it may affect how, how you uh, look at the process going forward. And of course with any uh, trade arrangement like this you want to look at on the positive side, the trade creation, the increased mobility of, of uh, factors of production, both of capital, of labor, and very importantly also on what are the impacts on, on the institutions of the countries that, uh, that participate. On the negative side, of course, we could have uh, you know, trade diversion that you, know, you trade uh, with uh, less efficient uh, uh, countries. Uh, you can have also very unequal, I mean one of the uh, objections to this from the beginning was that there was this big Russia and then you had these smaller economies that um, would, might not uh, benefit to the same extent. Also you had a strong uh, natural resource dependence, may not be the best uh, basis for, for this uh, type of, of um, integration. When we look at all these factors, uh, it's clear that there have been uh, gains from trade. There's also clear that there has been a trade diversion and when you look at uh, the, the net results, uh, the, the, the trade creation uh, dominates, but the benefits have not been distributed uh, equally. So clearly uh, Russia has benefited more from this uh, to date. I think this is something that one needs to take into account when going forward, finding ways of, of uh, uh, reallocating, as has been done in other arrangements, to, to uh, support those that may not benefit in the beginning uh, from, from as much. But, but also very importantly, the real benefits for the global community from this is if you can reduce non-tariff barriers, if you can facilitate trade, and uh, we need to have more emphasis on that. When we look at investments, investments have not happened very much. It's mostly about investments in, in Belarus, or mostly by Russian companies. For the rest, there's an enormous potential for investments uh, across uh, these different countries. Finally, looking at um, institutions, what you see is that these countries actually, when you look at the kind of institutions that we care about that to promote uh, economic activity, to promote uh, you know, a good business climate and so on, there's not much difference between these three countries and maybe it's, it, you know, there are very s severe weaknesses in all the countries. The real potential here is from improving the institutions at the, the uh, uh, federal level at the uh, Eurasian uh, economic space level uh, and that's very much also what, what happened in, in the um, case of the European Union. So let me summarize, the, we should take its uh, experiment or very seriously. We should um, have more focus on, on getting rid of non-trade barriers, more focus on mobility of, of uh, factor production, facilitating uh, mo mobility of, of investment, mobility of labor. We should um, w work a lot on in trying to learn from other experiences how did, this, how did you build in the best way these uh, institutions at the level of, of the, of the uh, uh, economic space uh, and try to use that vehicle to uh, promote uh, 
institutional improvements in, in the individual countries. Let me just end with a word of co caution. We see what happened in the European Union that if you accelerate this process too fast, if you don't think about the, the differential impact across the different countries that are part of this uh, arrangement, you may actually, uh, it may backfire. So what I would argue, proceed with caution, focus on, on how can you really build institutions that can promote uh, institutions at a de development at, at the national level and think about the differential impact uh, across countries. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. I believe that the risks and opportunities that have been described right now were the basis of the Eurasian uh, project uh, some 20 years ago when uh, uh, Mr. Nazarbayev, the Kazakh president, uh, expressed this idea. And uh, its implementation was fairly slow uh, not as active up until the very recent period. In the recent years, uh, there's been significant uh, acceleration with new formats and achievements, the customs union, uh, the removal of uh, uh, barriers, uh, the development of the new economic space, and the timing to achieve systemic results to uh, lay the foundation for a new legal framework based on the best world and national practices, uh, this timing is very short. And the president has set the objective to, com to finalize most of this work by 2015, the legal work. Of course, ex to expect an effect from this right away uh, it will not be realistic. Uh, however, uh, this effect is expected. Uh, mutual trade was mentioned, but that's a small part of the economy. And if you uh, know what the services market is, what its share is, there's yet a lot of room uh, to work on. And uh, we're not living in a very favorable uh, situation and that uh, impacts the uh, common economic space in the customs union, creating uh, more risks, more pressure, even though uh, this pressure uh, calls for more changes. And this is a, a complicated combination uh, with social pressures as well. So in this respect, I believe it important to try and maintain these global and regional relations uh, and not forgetting about uh, what Mr. Berglov has said about uh, this. So uh, uh, the attitude, I'd like to give the floor to uh, Mr. Mbet to, to to uh, speak about this. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, join in the discussion, uh, regionalization ver versus globalization. I believe that uh, Tatiana Volovaya was right to note that any regionalization is probably an attempt by a, par uh, a number of countries, a cluster of countries, to join in the globalization process. Whereas before 2007, globalization uh, brought about only positive trends, uh, world economic growth, credit boom, uh, which ended up uh, with the events of 2007 and 8, and at least both Soviet countries for the first time faced the threat of a global financial crisis. Then, of course, as a systemic response, this uh, uh, regionalization uh, is in a way an attempt to respond to those challenges of time that we have today. Globalization itself uh, was uh, a positive trend. We've seen uh, world trade to grow over these years. Uh, we've uh, seen uh, geographical specializations 
and uh, many countries. Of course, our country's specialization is based more on the exports of mineral and natural resources, but uh, we wanted to diversify that as well. Therefore, the approach itself, uh, what we have, uh, and globalization is not denied, and uh, uh, this is a process for Russia's uh, accession to the WTO and uh, the Kazakh negotiations on uh, WTO accession. This was done with OECD. Russia started it earlier. Now Kazakhstan is continuing on that. And uh, there's the strive to be uh, uh, on the level of high standards and uh, working with many multilateral institutions like the World Bank, uh, OECD is an integral part of this work as part of the uh, common economic space and the future Eurasian Economic Union. Because uh, many are saying, what is the uh, uh, Eurasian Economic Union? Let me re uh, reiterate that this is uh, based on best international pra world practices and development of your own best practices. Uh, at the same time, it could be said that the nature of regionalization is mostly a desire to keep your economic identity, because if you take it to absurdity, then uh, uh, there's a few places with good infrastructure, uh, labor, and then uh, Maybe there are things you don't have to do, but not everybody will agree. Therefore, uh, we are now actively studying the European experience, and I believe that the 50 years of integration uh, will not be all exhausted, but uh, still what we can see is uh, a reorganization of the entire uh, organism and how scrupulous the Europeans are in uh, uh, analyzing their positive and negative trends and uh, what solutions they're uh, offering. And then, of course, you can say that there are some countries that are successful, other which are not as successful. Uh, what should we do uh, with those? Uh, it may be about an extensive expansion of the Eurasian Union. This is on our agenda recently in Astana. We met on the level of uh, heads of state and uh, the Kyrgyzstan and the Ukraine uh, presented their applications to become observers. So this uh, common European space becomes a center of attraction uh, for interests in various governments. On the other hand, we understand that uh, we need some uh, strict compliance with principles uh, that form the basis of our organization. And Tatiana said that we're more active in it with intensive processes where the legislation of the common uh, economic space uh, will include uh, laws without exceptions from the rule rather than with, with exceptions. We're working on this, and by May 2014, we will have the first uh, results. Now let me get back to what Mr. Guriev raised. Mr. Guria, what's the nature of this uh, architecture that we're building? What shall we strive for? Of course, this is uh, first and foremost about regulation, about developing supranational regulators that uh, would uh, enable us to moderate many processes um, more successfully and flexibly. Then, of course, acquiring new competences, because uh, there is some technological lagging behind today. We need to catch up. There are many methodologies how to do that. You can see uh, how they create transboundary clusters uh, across the globe uh, and uh, what markets are targeted, Russia and Kazakhstan, uh, you, Belarus to a lesser extent, um, are a uh, trade partner number one for, uh, uh, I mean, have a European Union as trade partner number one and it would be nice for us to continue this work. On the other hand, the uh, global economic gravitation today is shifting towards uh, Asia. We know that by 2050, 
both China and India will be on the top three largest world economies. Uh, we cannot forget about that. Uh, we cannot deny it. Uh, and uh, we uh, must be parts to the economic uh, uh, processes in the framework of the Shanghai Economic Organization. So integration is now underway on all levels uh, in uh, G20, the BRICS dialogue, and where we have even no uh, other, well, our strive to be part of the processes, compliance with best regulatory practices within OECD is our systemic response to the threats of globalization uh, with respect to the loss of national identity that uh, we can see. So I believe, uh, uh, God permitting, we can overcome those quickly together. Thank you uh, very much, Kairat. Uh, we have Vice Premier from uh, uh, here uh, with whom uh, we've signed a memorandum uh, that mentions uh, Kyrgyzstan's uh, aim to become a full-fledged manager of the economic organization. So, uh, Kairat has uh, mentioned the topic of the European Union, the European European relations. So, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Uh, Larney, uh, who's uh, an international expert, has done a lot to promote interactions between Russia and Europe, uh, focusing on uh, Russia-German relations uh, as a locomotive, as a main driver of this movement. But let's not talk about the past. Let's talk about what, how it could be. Uh, because, for instance, some time ago, for Russia and the European Union, uh, the project uh, of uh, common European space was uh, uh, seemed to be a good project, better than the free trade agreement. It was broader. Unfortunately, in the first half of uh, the first decade of this uh, century, it slowed down. So, uh, Mr. Rar, don't you think that this project of uh, European economic space today could become relevant, uh, but as uh, part of the Eurasian space or European? Well, thank you. That is uh, precisely what I would uh, try to answer. But first, let me ask why the European Union is refusing or is so careful uh, with regard to the uh, any further promotion of the European Union, because they believe in the West that European Union has different values. Uh, well, it wasn't touched for the time being, but uh, it's uh, always present uh, on the, uh, in, in, the, in the backdrop. Uh, now, the regional economic communities, well, this is the topic of our today's uh, discussion. Is there a future for regional integrations or future globalization uh, will quickly unify the uh, world economy? There's two trends, in, uh, two schools. Uh, shall we have a uh, multipolar or uh, bipolar world, cultural, multilateral uh, uh, picture or common values? that uh, they keep talking about more and more. So this competition between regional uh, entities, uh, different currencies, or the world will tend to create world uh, rules, a world government uh, in the framework of uh, G8 or G20. Will the, will the dollar dominate as a global currency? Or shall will we continue to have uh, national sovereignties where economic decisions will be made by national governments uh, with the uh, supreme international law? Uh, or we're moving towards a world uh, where the role of states and governments will diminish, uh, leaving space for high moral human principles that the world is creating one way or another uh, under the control of international sanctions, military interventions, international courts of justice. Uh, these are fundamental questions that uh, 
we will see discussed uh, in the near future. And Russia, uh, with the BRICS countries, uh, even though they're following the traditional uh, path, Western countries, the transatlantic uh, uh, society is following the globalistic uh, approach. So I believe that uh, it's important if you look at what's going on in Europe, uh, the key to the solution of the world economic and political order uh, will be uh, double-faceted. So there's two competing ideas, two competing models. A few months ago, the Americans offered uh, the Europeans to create a free uh, trade zone with Europe. And Europeans uh, have been uh, not very enthusiastic about it until recently. Now the situation has changed, negotiations have launched and uh, uh, they will take a decisive stage in July, August. So uh, Russia, as regards the European Union, uh, in uh, the uh, creation of this free economic zone, is now on the, the, the back burner. So. Uh, it's uh, the West that is a priority, not the Eastern uh, zone, even though it's the United States who will win with this approach uh, in a alliance with the European Union. I believe that if the EU had a free economic zone with Russia, then it's uh, the European Union that would win. Uh, so Russia is wondering why the Europeans are not uh, choosing that. I believe it's all about politics. But these political issues need to be resolved uh, together uh, because uh, if uh, we are to have a Eurasian uh, Union, then these values have to be discussed. It's important. It's an important political project that we could focus on. Uh, we're not objecting against the project of the United States because everybody will win. Transfer of technology or exchanging technology for natural resources and then deeper expanded cooperation, new market for European goods. I believe that Mr. Merkel, who will come here tomorrow, this could be discussed with her. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Perhaps uh, very briefly, Peter Balish could uh, uh, reply uh, regarding the questions asked by Mr. Rar, particularly as you have been a uh, uh, participant is, uh, in such panels. Is anything changes? Is anything changing? Uh, uh, Mr. President, first of all, uh, this is an uh, issue of uh, globalization versus regionalization is a very lively question also within the EU and it's very clear that if the conditions were given for a successful completion of the uh, multilateral negotiations this year that would be the best but as we have heard and uh, unfortunately this is not the case so the uh, best should not be the enemy of the good therefore we uh, work towards now more regional approaches. Uh, the uh, U.S. free trade agreement has been mentioned, but let me focus now on the East, which is not at all neglected by the EU. After all, Russia is our, our number two, number three uh, uh, trading partner, and for Russia and the other two members, EU is, is number one uh, trading partner. We follow with much interest the development of this integration, and we welcome the establishment of another integration on the Eurasian continent and from the EU side we are ready to, uh, to work in a positive and cooperative manner uh, with this new integration. We, however, look also at the criteria and one criteria is whether this new integration brings a liberalization of the conditions for business, for trade compared to the earlier uh, uh, situation. And here there is a mixed picture. On one hand, Ru Russia's accession to the WTO meant that the common tariffs have been greatly reduced, but at the cost that Kazakhstan's tariffs have gone up very much. And this is an issue that we will have now to sort out in Kazakhstan's upcoming WTO accession, which from the EU side we very much support. We also look at the 
uh, trade measures of the, and practices of this new integration. Mostly these are positive. There was a, a, inter, a major opening in many areas, but it's also true that in a number of areas where the uh, organization, the uh, customs union is responsible, there were steps backwards. Tariff openings were not fully implemented. There were some problems in the technical and health area. These are issues on which we are working with our partners. Who can be our partners? In this stage, it can be only the W2 member, Russia, who represents the customs union in the World Trade Organization. As, uh, and we try to work in a positive manner and to find solutions until all three members of the customs union can join the World Trade Organization. That would be the basis when we can speak about an EU customs union uh, relationship. It is still some time away. But in between, we wouldn't like to stop the regional cooperation. We uh, offer also certain bridges through the establishment of close integration relations with some of the ex uh, countries, with Ukraine and uh, Moldova and others, by signing deep and comprehensive free trade agreements with these countries, which keep open the possibility of maintaining and even developing the, uh, these countries' relations with the customs union and with the members of the customs union. So we, pro uh, we promote such an open, multifaceted regional cooperation as a contribution to the uh, uh, global liberalization. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Balish. Just one thing to underscore, the customs union in place has uh, built its practice and legislation in the commercial area based on WTO rules and norms. This is a common a unique norm for all the three countries parts of the customs union and in this respect de facto Kazakhstan and Belarus not just as regards tariffs but also all the rules and procedures follow the WTO norms this is an advanced so to say accelerated compliance which simplifies understanding the dialogue and uh, the understanding for the investors and hopefully for the authorities of our key partners this will also be an important factor to take into account particularly that any decisions made are a supranational competence something for us uh, to remember let me now give the floor to Igor Shuvalov who represents the Russian Federation with uh, one uh, a uh, key issue here. Russia is represented perhaps in the majority of formats uh, existing right now, G8, G20, and different uh, associations in the Pacific organizations. And uh, Russia is now building a long-term dialogue with the European Union and so on and so forth. So in uh, all this, we uh, have a Eurasian project, and it's not easy to combine everything. But on the other hand, we have to do that. Igor Ivanovich, what do you think uh, today how we can use this global positioning of Russia and on the other hand, the project so as to move uh, ahead? Victor Manish, I'm going to answer your question, but I would like to react first to what Alexander Aurar and Peter Balash uh, have said. Uh, we're talking about values, political attitudes uh, towards uh, possible integration processes within the Eurasian Union, and the integration of other uh, players, and what we are witnessing right, uh, right now is some uh, cool, uh, cooling down on the part of the European Union, how they are going to join the Union, building common economic space with, this, with Russia. So what we are witnessing right now, I think we should recognize that there is more politics in all these processes than economies. So the first thing I would like to say is, is as we work in the uh, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Russia format, we are not 
building any political integration. So these uh, uh, customs union or common economic space, uh, hopefully Eurasian economic space, everyone treat this as a, a growing economic might, economic power that will, may lead eventually to new political institutions. But on new levels, when presidents meet, when we work in the government and the experts, uh, uh, the, the, we do not touch uh, on, uh, upon these issues, the political integration. It's a kind of taboo, as nobody really wants to uh, send uh, any signals that we are so far acting within the framework of this uh, tripartite agreement already to uh, create any supranational political institutions. This is not our priority. It's not uh, even the second-rate uh, issue in our political agenda. There are people in every country, in Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Russia, that would like to see these institutions grow, to have this kind of political superstructure. And they remember that there was a country like the Soviet Union, but today there's nothing like this on the agenda in our uh, work agenda or e even within the framework of uh, bilateral uh, meetings. So I can assure you that we are building and focusing our attention pre uh, precisely on economic issues so, and on setting up the institutes that will promote economic growth. And I think the people are afraid of this uh, European, Eurasian Economic Union because it's going to be a very powerful economic player. So far, the uh, Russian and Belarusian and Kazakhstan potential are not uh, open to the full extent. But when uh, it will enter the new phase with all the mineral wealth and everything, I think, uh, you know, the, some members of the European Union, as they um, try to join us, they come to us and feel uh, a little bit unprotected. But wh what we would like to see, we would like to see ours as a powerful global player. So in this case, we would be, uh, we would be able to claim uh, the role that we deserve uh, in the global integration. Secondly, we are not creating any isolated uh, organizations. Or um, So I, I would like uh, I don't want to hear any speculations at that point. So some people are afraid that we are creating something that will be transformed into something else. So we are not going to in isolate our economies from the outer worlds. Uh, this is stupid to think so. And Victor Bersuch just said, we are building a Eurasian economic union uh, based on the principles of the World Trade Organization. But uh, within the framework of the Eurasian Economic Commission, when uh, <clears throat> we hold uh, sessions of this uh, council, uh, Karol Dumanovic, uh, our Belarusian colleague, and myself, uh, we already have an agenda of Russia's joining OECD. So we are even preparing an agreement already. We are drafting an agreement that will include not only the principles underlying our behavior in the World Trade Organization, but also the best uh, legislative practices and the principles underlying OECD uh, activities. So this is an important issue, and we are working on this agenda right now. Therefore, uh, an organization that will uh, create such an economic power is open to uh, integration in other formats as well. And uh, of course, it, we are not trying to create any uncivilized uh, forms uh, of behavior. We are using only the best practices of OECD and WTO. And perhaps at this stage, uh, uh, we can offer something new uh, on new civilized principles that we are ready to discuss in the area of world trade and investment policies. We're going to discuss this with our partners uh, from different European organizations. So therefore, I would like to emphasize once again, you shouldn't be afraid of uh, something that we are not going to create. At least I've never heard anything uh, to this point uh, uh, within our government. But you should know that there are certain sections of the population in the country, the people who would like to see something like that. These are mostly people, older generation people, who grew up in the Soviet Union. They have their memory. And uh, well, of course, when they heard about the customs union, it, it was, they were kind of delighted. They saw that it's a kind of anticipation of something like you know, this new organization. But we are not going to play into that. So you should. Uh, rest assured that this is not our aim to do that. Now, just uh, 
as regards the values uh, that we share within the Eurasian Economic Union? Well, first of all, of course, if you uh, travel to one of the EU countries and uh, uh, switch on a TV or listen to the radio, and uh, you will have uh, uh, probably an impression that we live on the moon. And the values uh, of the Russian uh, authorities are something alien to the world community. I think this is a kind of stereotypes imposed through the well uh, tuned uh, propaganda system. Even the experts who are uh, well aware of what's going on in Russia and Belarus, well, you understand that in Russia uh, we are set to create uh, the universal uh, human uh, values. I was working as a Sherpa in G8 once, and this year in the G20 uh, presidency, we admit that given all the arguments, uh, uh, Russia is based on the common uh, principles, uh, universal principles, when we preach the common civilized principles. Just uh, some key issues sometimes uh, <coughs> provoke uh, arguments and disputes. Uh, well, we, we do not say that Russia is uh, preaching some other values. We just have some, sometimes have a, another viewpoint. We don't want uh, others to impose a different viewpoint on us. And sometimes we have dis disputes. So you don't have to invent anything here. And please don't blame us for something that we have not done. So I was talking about the values uh, that are uh, inherent in uh, the entire society in any country. Are sh there are some, uh, but there are other values shared, but only a small group of the population. And uh, it doesn't mean that these values have been universally accepted and universally recognized by everyone. And um, I don't think you, we can discuss these values in terms of some negative attitudes. The majority of our population, I'm sure you understand what I mean, the majority of our population are not ready so far to uh, subscribe to these values, and they do not consider them as being values. And it's uh, quite doubtful that uh, such values should be uh, introduced, implemented everywhere as the basic principles underlying the society. Some people, you know, have di people uh, have differing views. So if, if we proceed from the uh, human basic rights, if we look at uh, the political system, and uh, the way it develops, uh, the freedom, uh, individual freedoms, uh, in, uh, freedom of uh, businesses and, and businessmen, it's one thing. But as for mm, some institutions and certain issues, individual issues, we have different attitudes towards these values. That's why we have different countries in the world. Uh, mm, uh, today, you know, is uh, Russia is very different from Russia of 1993, uh, just as Germany is totally different from what was 50 years ago. So I should tell you that this is a process, evolutionary process, and the building of integration mechanisms. Therefore, the more European Union and other countries um, reserve this integration track, the uh, more impressions people will have that Russia have some other values. We do not have any other, any alternative values. I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. Um, uh, so that's why we're talking about common values, no political ambitions in terms of creating the Eurasian uh, Union. Um, new members joining the Eurasian Union will have to share the norms of behavior, the standards, our common approaches. As for other formats, uh, there was a question about this here. We, uh, I think we will find a place for every format that we're dealing with right now. We are not going to develop any formats to the detriment of others. So that's uh, the way we see all these integration tracks. And no doubt, uh, we believe that the most important uh, point, uh, the most important thing, so is to ensure ensure that we could be a, a equal partners. We need a Eurasian Economic Union because uh, the three countries are much more powerful than just. Uh, one taken separately, and in this case, we will be comparable in terms of economic power with our with uh, European countries, with Asian countries. So it's not just that we are going to integrate into one economic space with um, European Union and uh, building serious e economic. In order to do that and to build serious economic relations with China and other countries, we have to be civilized ourselves. So that's why we are integrating towards East, West, and the South. And there is uh, logics behind this and a clear plan. 
we have declared we are not going to uh, <clears throat> wrap up our trade relations with European Union and moving uh, to the east instead. We, we do want to develop our trade relations uh, with Europe, but we just want to ensure that our relations will be more balanced and more sustainable and to increase the volume of trade with um, Asian countries. Uh, that doesn't mean that we want to trade less with the European Union. No. We would like to uh, have uh, more trade volumes with the European Union, more than 5% per year. So that's basically uh, what I wanted to say. So there is uh, no uh, damage, no detriment to any other format. There is integration. There is a core, of course, from the Customs Union towards the Eurasian Union. As we create such a powerful association, we'll be moving towards the common economic space with the European Union as our closest neighbor. And I think that the uh, kind of uh, lukewarm relationship that existing between us ri right now will, uh, is likely to be replaced with other uh, sentiments so we could be looked upon as a key player. Thank you, Igor Ivanovich. We have a unique person in our panel discussion, in my view, who has um, um, a tremendous expertise, um, uh, the uh, experience uh, that was uh, one of the most important uh, stage in the life of the European Union when Pascal Lamer worked in uh, Delors' team, when he worked as the commissioner uh, for the European Union, uh, and uh, in, uh, to a certain extent, the key elements, uh, the basic elements were created at that time. But uh, there was a honeymoon, by the way, for the relationship between the European Union and the Russian Federation. And at that time, we were not just discussing the common economic space, but at that time we were discussing the common energy space or single energy space. And in this sense, uh, uh, there is no such dream in the portfolio right now. I don't know uh, who is uh, uh, should be blamed for that. Nevertheless, he is in charge of the world trade. Uh, organization, the institute, uh, which is associated with the globalization institutes. Uh, so this is huge work, you know, uh, trade uh, rules and standards. Well, there are problems, of course, everywhere. The Doha round, which was not completed, and some issues uh, that we are discussing today as an attempt uh, <clears throat> uh, to regulate certain issues, setting a trend. Uh, for development today, but I think that there are more questions that we can then we can cover today. But I think well, probably there was a failure in the management system. Maybe I don't know, Pascal. What do you think about that? Well, let me give you my uh, frank uh, answer to the basic question uh, about the interaction, compatibility, tensions between uh, regional integration and, let's say, global integration. My definite view on this is that uh, regional integration is and will remain one major conduct to harnessing globalization. And the fundamental reason for that is that uh, there remains a premium to proximity in economic integration. Not because of the reasons of the past, where there has always been in trade a premium to proximity which was linked to the cost of distance. Now, this old reason why there was a premium of proximity is disappearing. The cost of distance is shrinking formidably under uh, the impact of uh, technology. So we live in a world where the cost of distance is disappearing. But where proximity matters is because market integration today is about areas which are culturally charged. What, uh, you uh, just uh, mentioned, uh, Igor, about value is fundamental in uh, market integration today and tomorrow. The obstacles to market integration today are not anymore tariffs. 
they are non-tariff measures, they are regulatory standards, they are about food safety, they are about lighter safety, they are about toy safety, they are about precaution, they are about risk management. They're not anymore about protecting the producer. They are about protecting the consumer. And when you are in this business of precaution, of risk management, you work with a scale of risk in mind, which is value tainted. A risk, addressing a risk is locating uh, your system somewhere between what risk to be bad and what could be better. <coughs> this has to do with values. And values are easier to coalize, to conglomerate with proximity. Because you deal with people who have a sort of similar sense of history, sometimes the same language, sometimes the uh, same historical experience. So that's the fundamental reason why there will remain a big premium to regional proximity integration. And the big question is and remains whether this leads to a global convergence or whether this leads to a fragmentation. And this is all the more important that we are now talking about regulatory issues. Are we moving towards a global regulatory system that handles this sort of consumer risk management precaution systems, or are we moving because of different scales of risk perception to something which would be fragmented? Now, so far, so good. Regional integration for the last, let's say, 50 years has not disenergized with global integration. Whether you look at uh, regional integration processes who have momentum, like the Eurasian uh, space, like what's happening in East Africa, like what's happening in Central America, which are regional integration processes which are doing well, who have political momentum, whether you look at other regional integration processes which obviously are struggling uh, like uh, Mercosur, uh, like what's happening or not happening in the Andean region in uh, Latin America, whether you look at what's happening or not happening in Western Central Africa, whether you look at what's not happening in the Gulf uh, region, whether they work or not, whether there is speed or not, whether there is energy or not, so far, so far, all this has been converging. But, but, Let's remember, it was mostly about addressing classical obstacle to trade. The question uh, which remains open is, uh, what about the future? And on this, I think the jury is still out. Because what we are seeing today is uh, another form of regional integration, which is less based on proximity, uh, the sort of uh, mega uh, virtual uh, deals, uh, some of which are clearly uh, pluricontinental, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, uh, US, uh, EU Transatlantic Agreement, uh, ASEAN uh, Plus Six, uh, RCP between China, uh, Korea, Japan, uh, EU, Japan uh, negotiations. These big deals are another animal in regional integration, as if, by the way, you need to go regional pluricontinental before you move global. Now, whether these virtual agreements will or not converge to a global regulatory standard is, again, an open question. Huh? If I talk about this uh, in Brussels, uh, they tell me, yeah, yeah, all this will converge because we will make it convert. When I talk about this in Washington, I'm told, yeah, yeah, it's going to be convergence because we will make it convert. When I talk about this in Tokyo, they say, oh, of course it's going to converge. We are going to make it converge. Now, 
whether these uh, sort of ambitions that they, each of them are going to make it convert their way and the others are going to come their way, well, question mark. Huh? So, I would be cautious and not just build on the fact that so far it has synergized. I'm not that sure that in the future it will. Which leads me to two uh, operational uh, recommendations, uh, which I think I can, uh, I can make uh, uh, without uh, endangering my uh, institutional position uh, in WTO until uh, 31st of August uh, midnight. Uh, first one has to do with uh, where is Russia in this game. If you look at all these mega deals, which I just mentioned, so five, six of them, uh, they encompass roughly 80% of the world economy. And outside these mega deals, you find uh, Africa, Russia, Brazil, Argentina, and the Gulf. This is a question which I think Russia needs to look at. If you are left with assuming this converges, uh, the only option is to join without sitting at the table. Assuming it does not converge, be faced with a fragmented regulatory system, in both cases, this is a problem for you. So, if I may, you need to be part of that game. And the most obvious and easy way to be part of that game is probably to re-energize a deep EU-Russia integration system. I doubt you can make that with the US for various reasons. I'm not sure you would think about doing this with China for various reasons. Uh, that's, I think, your strategic option. Second uh, operational recommendation, which goes uh, beyond uh, what we are operating with for the moment, the reality is that there is no serious global forum for standard convergence. What we have is a Codex Alimentarius for Food Safety, an international standardization organization, the International Organization for Animal Health, the organiza International Organization for Plant Health. We do not have anything like a forum which would be, the mission of which would be to organize, oversee, monitor convergence of these standards. Now, many people will put this uh, under the roof of WTO because they don't know exactly what WTO is doing and not doing. But WTO so far is not doing sectoral regulation. Sectoral global regulation is done elsewhere. Take uh, banking and insurance, for instance, which is something which is starting to happening. There is a sort of a stealth uh, world finance organization, uh, which is the Financial Stability Board in Basel. This is not done by WTO itself. And I'm not pretending WTO should enter into the business of negotiating within the WTO roof all these food lighters, safety, car emission, uh, in banking on insurance regulation. But what I'm saying is that there needs to be a system that oversees that this system converges. And this, in my view, has to do with a sort of global convening power of WTO, so we have in my view to find something in the future which will ensure that, including for a country like Russia, uh, if you mind about this regulatory convergence, and Russia has to mind about this regulatory convergence, you have enough of a guarantee that moving in this direction will not harm your own economic and social interests. Thank you, Mr. Lamy.
Well, there are two points, uh, quite important points uh, to emphasize here that integration, even regional integration, is not always coinciding with uh, territorial integration. And the, ba the fundamentals of this integration are demonstrated today in the world. And the second important point, uh, which I think is quite important to all of us, is that today as we enter uh, WTO, we should have discussed the aftermath for any industry or for the plants or factories, but uh, rather uh, the type of behavior we should pursue in this organization so as to transform our, ourselves and uh, to be included in the uh, process of upgrading this organization. So I think this sort of inclusion in this process is one of the uh, important tax as we exhausted our schedule. We understand that there is a next uh, panel discussion. That's why I would like to ask a few brief questions to our panelists uh, and expecting such brief answers from you. Mr. Uh, Leroux, uh, in the World Bank, you are in charge of the sector that is related uh, with the activities uh, uh, of the former Soviet Union countries. Uh, the uh, countries that were used uh, to be in the Comic-Con uh, circle that were once part of the larger Soviet system. So you, as we understand, you are in charge of the structural reforms in these countries. Can you tell us what's happening right now in these countries within the framework of integration processes? Uh, does it uh, promote diversification of the economies and structural transformations? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, everybody. I, um, <clears throat> a lot of things have been said already by uh, previous speakers. So I'm going to try to kind of zoom in a few points. First of all, to get rid of, uh, kind of pre principles, the World Bank does support very strongly the openness of trade because this is the most powerful engine of uh, development and poverty alleviation uh, for the last uh, 50 years. So that, for us, is uh, very clear. We are a bit less clear on regional integration. We believe it can be good or less good, but it all depends on what are the external tariffs. And that's what Eric was uh, saying with trade diversion versus uh, trade creation, and same for standards. So it can be good, it can be less good. It all depends. It's a very practical, empirical question. Now, what I'd like to talk is about the diversification, because after all, why do we talk about all this? Is that in the end of the day, is improving the life of people, well-being, and poverty alleviation. When you look at the experience of the CIS, the Commonwealth of Independent States, since 95, the picture is quite interesting. First of all, the trade among the CIS went down. At the same time, there is a concentration of exports on natural resources. But what has been the outcome of all this? In the last 10 years, the income per capita in the CIS countries have been multiplied by six. 100 million people have been lift, lifted out of poverty. So a couple of things, very simple but powerful numbers. First lessons, the openness has worked. Comparative advantage, which is natural resources, has worked. And we believe that because the risk management has been quite good in the CIS, with good macroeconomic uh, policies and stabilization fund, most resource-rich countries have avoided the famous uh, Dutch disease so far. It's always a danger, but so far, very good management on the macro side. And again, stabilization funds have been well designed and well implemented. We believe that there is no such a thing. It's very fashionable to talk about the resource curse. Oh, it's horrible, you have resources. We believe this is good. This is a blessing. The problem is what do you do with it? And that comes the diversification. A lot of countries put in their national plans, including here in Russia. We have to diversify to reduce the risk. <coughs> the danger with that is that how you diversify and this is where we have produced, we are producing a paper with uh, Igor here from the Eurasian Development Bank together called the Diversified uh, Development. What we found is very interesting and we looked around the world for experience from California to Australia, Canada, Norway, I mean the usual uh, culprit, Brazil uh, uh, and others. What we found is 
Industrial policy can be a double-edged sword. You have to be very careful. And rather than focusing on diversifying products for exports or production, it's far better to focus on changing your balance of facets, your endowments in the jargon. And that means infrastructure. There's still a lag in the CIS compared with OECD countries, but even compared to uh, Central uh, Europe. So, and that is uh, transport, and, but not only other, uh, other, all kind of infrastructure where I think the CIS has to pay a lot of attention and to do it efficiently, which means good public spending and efficiency in public spending. Another thing is human capital. This is not static, it moves. So big, big need for investment in education. Here, CIS countries differ vastly. I think that we see some of the country like uh, Kazakhstan and, uh, or, and Azerbaijan where they're lagging behind in the PISA test, for example. So investment in education and health, by the way, is uh, something that we believe is a priority to change the dynamic of endowment that will result in the diversification of products later on. And finally, and maybe the most important, and that you mentioned structural reforms, is the, the build-up of institutions. So we believe that physical human capital and strengthening the institutions are the key for the prosperous future of, these, uh, of the CIS and the Eurasian uh, space. Again, on institutions, it's a big word that is very convenient because we put a lot of things in it. But it's, it's, fu it's fundamentally good policies. I mean, we are talking a lot about doing business regulatory framework to, to, to facilitate private sector development. But it's not only the laws and the regulation. It's also the capacity of the public administration to design them and then implement them. The capacity of the courts, the judicial system, to actually follow up and implement them. So again, if I sum up, I mean, we can go on for a long time, but we, we do believe that going back to the essential is very important. And, and there have been a lot of progress made. That's why I quoted these uh, very uh, seizing numbers uh, at the beginning. But we believe that there's still a stretch in these three elements of endowment, physical capital, human capital, and institutional capital. This is, we believe, is the best possible industrial policy, because that will result, it's a second derivative, will be in fact the, the diversification of product and services, exports and production. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Leoru. And now, uh, our concluding panelist, Mr. Matien, at the end of the discussion, uh, I probably the only question to ask will be this, Ukraine, and you uh, as an authorized uh, uh, official. U Ukraine has said that they want to be an observer in the Eurasian Economic Union. And, uh, you know, and, and any action in this area uh, comes under uh, criticism. Uh, it becomes an object of discussion and debate. So what now? Thank you, dear Victor. I don't have much time, but I'd like to say a lot. The problems discussed today are not just relevant, but uh, uh, are uh, of uh, uh, crucial importance because uh, we are on the verge of chaos. And to avoid Brown's movement, then three heads of state have uh, selected the right vector. And the economic union, the Eurasian economic union, is the future, and Ukraine uh, sees itself as part of it. Because um, there's a mathematical modeling expert uh, estimates. Any formula you can take, Eurasia is 58 million square kilometers. Add Ukraine, and you get a golden number. So Ukraine is the minimum that Eurasian Economic Union needs. Number two, we should view this problem much deeper. Mr. Rahr uh, said that everything's fine. In Europe, the European Union has been in recession for seven years. The uh, they are at number 190 in uh, uh, growth rates. Let me warn that calculations have shown 
they, they have lost 400,000 uh, jobs, the effect will be 0, 0.22, 25 percent growth. So to me, the Eurasian Economic Union that we're building, based on all the potentials, because today it's uh, uh, an impor very important uh, economic space. There's, the human capital is exhausted. And to me, the Eurasian Economic Union uh, is uh, something that the entire world is uh, looking at. Uh, it's, uh, it's like Noah's Ark. And uh, then I believe that the invitation to, be, to, to them is, is an invitation to the Titanic. So I suggest that you join us in, in the Noah's Ark. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mondian. Alexander has, uh, even had his uh, name tag, f his name tag fell down after this invitation to the Titanic. Well, uh, uh, let me f uh, say, uh, express gratitude to all those who have uh, taken part in our today's discussion. Uh, I'm sorry not everybody who wanted to speak had the chance uh, to have the floor because uh, we uh, did not have much, uh, enough time. Uh, this is a debate that has started but must go on. It has to continue because this is a dialogue uh, 